Hello and welcome to On Point. I am Melina Rudigkeit. It's been a few months since the legalization of street vending in Los Angeles and already it's expected to make a big difference in the lives of many. There are an estimated 50,000 street vendors in Los Angeles and many of them are immigrants, some undocumented. Prior to the legalization of street vending, vendors would have frequent run-ins with police and immigration officers. The ordinance, known as SB 946, prevents any California city from harassing vendors. It gives vendors the opportunity to reserve specific locations where they can sell their goods. Street vendors are not allowed near large event venues such as Staples Center and the Los Angeles Coliseum. At city parks, two vendors per acre are allowed. Vendors will also need to get a business license, pay taxes and get health permits. Vendors who do not follow the rules can still get fined and cited by the Department of Street Services. Many vendors say that they feel a sense of security with this bill. Now people have the permit to be able to sell on the streets freely. I am actually in the process of getting a permit. This bill, signed by Governor Jerry Brown, is a triumph for all street vendors as it allows them to work. It allows them to make a living and it allows them to share their culture and foods. On point, Sofia Gutierrez has more on the story. Thank you, Melina. Today I'm joined with Greg Kettles, who is a city law attorney, Antonio Bernabe, who is the organizing director at Chirla, and Mauricio Ramos, who works with marketing and membership at Chirla. Thank you so much for being here and joining us. So let's get started. Street vending is now legal in California. What are the Safe Sidewalk Vending Act guidelines? Greg, can we start with you? Certainly. So um, the state of California passed a law saying that if cities are going to regulate street vending, they need to do it basically with a light touch. Um, if they're going to restrict where vendors can do their uh, vending operations, they have to have real reasons, objective health, safety, and welfare uh, regulations. And furthermore, if someone breaks the rules, they can come down really heavy on them. They can't enforce criminal penalties. They can't enforce um, uh, um, administrative citations. Instead, it's more of a lighter touch of basically fines that can be imposed on vendors who wind up breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Antonio, would you like to add anything? Yeah, that uh, according to California, according to the theory, it is legal, but it's not happening yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's f for the cities for the cities to open a process to legalize the vending at any city. Los Angeles, where we are, is using the process. And now they got one more year. I have to say first that we passed an ordinance in the city two years ago, mm -hmm. and then they passed the uh, state law a year ago, and now we are in the process for the city again, because basically they start all over again with the state law for a new process. This is an education process to the vendors to find out how it's going to be, how, it's going to, how much is going to be the cost of the permits, where the permits are going to be. So it's a whole process. Also, is for them to know about uh, about taxes because they have to pay sell taxes, they have to pay for the permits, and also they have to buy equipment. Mm -hmm. So it's not happening from one day to the other. It's a process that is not happening yet in LA. The, the, the vendors at this time are part of the educational process for a year, and then after a year, the permits are going to be there for them. And Antonio, who is the typical street vendor? There's a lot of stereotypes. This is uh, something uh, that we have to clarify because street vending is when that happens only in the sidewalk. Mm, I see. When that's happening on the street, that they do have like a lunch truck or ice, uh, ice, cream, ice, cream, ice cream truck or ice cream car, that's illegal mm -hmm. because they're moving. And mm -hmm. because the car or the truck is in compliance with the city regulation and the health regulations. Mm -hmm. So that's on the street, but that's legal. The problem is when somebody's selling food or anything else like electronics, you know, wires for cell phones or belts on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And how often are they undocumented? Well, uh, it is the reason that Chirla got into this uh, struggle because uh, was uh, uh, like, 2012, 2011, I mean 2011, it was uh, a practice with the LAPD arresting vendors and basically disappearing the vendors in the middle of the night. 
how that happened. That happened in 77 station, South LA. Uh, that's basically calling immigration. Mm -hmm. And immigration was passing by in the middle of the night, taking all the vendors, and next day the vendor was already in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So that's why it got involved, because that was illegal. And who fixed that? LAPD. Because that was illegal practices against the LAPD regulations and practices. Mm -hmm. So that's why we got involved, because the street vendors were just, dis were just disappearing. Single mothers leaving the kids, mm -hmm. you know, a single mother that is selling tamales, going out to, in the middle of the, uh, no, in, the, in the morning, to get something for the family to provide for the family, and that lady just disappeared in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So that's why we got involved because that was not right. And now it's been a process. We are part of this coalition that is more than 50 organizations in Los Angeles that is fighting for this to be regulated. First, we stop the criminalization with the LAPD because they want to cooperate because the, the reason for the LAPD to exist is not to be uh, dividing families, is not to be kidnapping street vendors, is to secure the people. Mm -hmm. So and then LAPD, the LAPD uh, chief said, after two years of talking to them, after two years of the, or showing them the, the, the proofs that they were basically delivering street vendors to ICE, ISIS, uh, like, like the immigration, so uh, they agree not to criminalize street vendors anymore, mm -hmm. not to arrest street vendors anymore. Just given a ticket, uh, but just a, a fine, no, not being arrested anymore. So and now we are into that kind of uh, moratorium until the permit is out after a year. Mm -hmm. And does the law protect these rights? Well, to be set, to be going out to sell to provide for your family, it's a, uh, it's legal. I mean, morally, it's uh, it's it's legal too. So and then, uh, why you have to be attacking these people that is trying to provide for themselves? And also, this is the only big city in in the United States that doesn't have a work. I mean, a selling permit, because New York, they do have uh, permits to sell in the streets of New York on the sidewalks of New York and other big streets also, Chicago, but LA is the only one that is getting behind. Mm -hmm. And how does a street vendor typically start their day? Mauricio, can we start with you? Um, I just want to also add to what he was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, CHILA stands for the Coalition for Human Immigrant Rights, and it's all about the human rights of individuals, regardless of their um, status here. Um, and so the street vending was sort of like the foundation setting up for Know Your Rights and the Know Your Rights campaign. Um, we have a companion piece to go with this that deals with ICE raids and ICE detentions. Um, so I just wanted to make, you know, to, to add to that. Um, mm -hmm. Street vendors, you know, they start the day very early in the morning. Um, they, um, it's a very arduous job in the heat, um, in the summer especially, um, and oftentimes they don't, you know, the kind of money they bring in, in the end, it's not worth all the labor that they're putting into. So when they get fined or they get, um, you know, taken into custody or even deported, um, it's not really worth it to them in the end. But um, that's how we, can, where we come in as an organization, part of the coalition, like Tony said, to then uh, educate them about the, the, the dangers of what's, what's happening on the streets and also how they can defend themselves and how organizations like us exist to do, to do that. Can you tell us about the vendors that you've met and the struggles that they've faced? Craig, we'll start with you. Well, when I, um, when my wife and I interviewed vendors in MacArthur Park 10 or 15 years ago, I was struck by the variety of stories. So there were older women who had been vending on the street for 20 years, and this was their spot for years. And they were professionals. This is how they helped support their family. Uh, other people, especially younger people, were in between jobs and vending was a way for them to make a little bit of money while, while they were trying to find something different, a different kind of a job, a more permanent job um, elsewhere. Um, so there was a lot of variety, a lot of different stories, um, but what really struck me about it was the flexibility of vending for, for women with children at home. If they had a sick child, they wouldn't have to vend that day. They wouldn't have to ask permission from the boss. They could just take that day off. Students could decide when they wanted to vent. If they had classes in the afternoon, they could vent in the morning and vice versa. So that's one of the beautiful things about street vending as a profession. And I'm glad that the state of California and the city of Los Angeles 
uh, both of them have recognized um, all the benefits of vending, not only for consumers, which I think is obvious, but also for the people who are doing the selling. It's really terrific for them, too. Mm. Antonio, would you like to add on? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a world. It's 50,000 street vendors in Los Angeles. It's a, a big economy behind because they had to buy the materials to cook or what they are selling or reselling. So it's millions and millions of dollars behind the street vending in Los Angeles that has to be regulated mm -hmm. for the benefit of street vendors, but also for the benefit of the city. Mm -hmm. Because uh, street vending is a practice that is the support of many low income families because they can get very little. They don't get to get, I mean, nobody's getting rich selling the street. Mm -hmm. It's just to survive. In the meantime, that they uh, get something else, they get a job, or somebody in the family is going to a school or going to the university and is graduating and supplying for the family and helping, it's a it, it's it's a survival issue. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And how does the law work? Do you need a license, and how is it that you get one, Craig? Well, the the city of Los Angeles is intending to set up a permit. Uh, regime that's not required by state law. State law says if you're going to regulate, you have to regulate with a light touch. Uh, so the city of Los Angeles has decided that they want to go with a permit regime. And the, the way they, they haven't set it up yet, but they, they're going that route because they, they understand that a lot of vendors say, I want my own space. Mm -hmm. I want my own dedicated space so I don't have to fight with anyone for it other vendors, I can't be extorted by a street gang for my space. So a permit is a way for a vendor to say, this is my spot and I paid for it, I don't have to answer to anyone else for mm -hmm. it. Um, so that regime hasn't been set up yet. The, the downside with a permit approach is that well, the, it costs money to set up and police that kind of setup. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cities where they have legalized street vending, there isn't a permit regime. There are just rules and vendors go out there and they work it out on between themselves who has what spot. I understand there's a two vendor per acre rule at parks. How does it work on the streets? Is it first come, first serve, or do you have to request a spot? Well, okay. when I understand that when the permit regime is set up, the permit's gonna be tied to a particular spot if you're a stationary vendor mm -hmm. in a commercial area or an industrial area. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the plan is to have the businesses in collaboration because if you go to New York, even the businesses are taking advantage of that because there are street vendors, but the businesses are putting their own merchandise out to the sidewalk to sell on the sidewalk too. So, but also these regulations in Los Angeles is, are gonna tell you how many feet you can be from the entrance of a business and how many feet from the, from the wall of the business and how many feet you can take of the sidewalk. It's basically, mm -hmm. according to the regulation, you play yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that's in, and that's in the process. Because uh, sometimes it's complicated. It's also uh, opening a new industry of uh, suppliers, or su I, mean, I mean supplies and equipment, because they had to create a car, a hot dog car that fit into that space. Mm -hmm. So that's, they had to create something new or something that has a little refrigerator and you are selling like fruits uh, or something that needs to be into a refrigerator or something that has to be that small. So they're already, you know, working on it. Because mm -hmm. it's like I said, it's a big industry. And Antonio, I understand you created the National Model for Day of Labor Center. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it is, on, well, it is something different, but uh, basically day labors are a newcomers. Now it's changing, little by little it's changing. But in the past, when we started in Chirla in the 90s, it was the newcomers, the new workers coming to Los Angeles trying to look for a job. Because basically being a day laborer is looking for work permanently. It's not like a, you got a job, to, you got a job, you are not a day laborer anymore. But uh, you are going to the Home Depot to offer your uh, experience and your uh, physical strength to somebody to f build a fence or something, that's the market of the day laborers. It's a casual job, it's a casual help. That the city needs because we got more than, more than 120,000 day laborers in the city that are in Home Depot, 
uh, donut shops, gas stations, use offering their experience, but also their help to somebody. And Greg, you've studied the issue with street vending. What do you think made it possible to legalize it now than in the 1990s? Well, that's a good question. So in the 1990s, the city, made, city of Los Angeles made a run at legalizing it, but what they came up with was incredibly bureaucratic um, and didn't work. Mm -hmm. What's changed since then is, one, the city learned from its mistake, I think, in the 1990s and said, we're not going to do that again. We're going to come up with a better approach. Secondly, the city became a lot more diverse um, in the past 15 or 20 years, and I think the people in Los Angeles look at street vending more favorably right now. They think, this is a great way for, for me to buy something on the street when I'm waiting for the bus. It's an honorable way to make a living. Why should it be illegal? Mm -hmm. and, um, and thirdly, I, I think the election of President Trump uh, and his uh, hard line and hard rhetoric against uh, the undocumented really shamed the city of Los Angeles and, and, and the state of California to do something to protect our neighbors who are suddenly at risk of being deported just because they were selling corn on the corner. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. So I think all of these things came together and made it possible for it to be legalized in the city and then statewide. Mm -hmm. Now, Mauricio, can you tell us a little bit about what Chirla does and how it aims to protect street vendors? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, I think the, the street vendors also deserve a lot of credit in terms of being, having this entrepreneurial sense mm -hmm. um, and not giving up, you know, um, having a, a way to survive and um, provide to their family, especially um, women and the children. Um, well, Cherla has been doing this since 1986, when, that's when we were founded. Um, we were uh, funded as a result of the 1986 uh, Immigration Reform Act. and. Um, Tony's been with the organization since the 90s, a very long time, and he's been very um, instrumental in the whole process of um, with the lay, day laborers, street vendors, uh, domestic workers, uh, working very closely with them because they sort of all interconnect. Um, and like I mentioned before, it just Chile is just here to provide that human relief and protection to um, all these groups. Um, and street vending is one of the our big priorities um, to hopefully you know make it official, legal uh, here in Los Angeles and then continue to protect our, our folks doing this uh, hard, hard work. And I understand Chirla has an Inmigrantes en Acción, Immigrants in Action campaign, that they engage registered voters in California to vote. Do you think the campaign helped pass the Safe Sidewalk Vending Act? Yes. Uh, I also, I have to say that this is a unique campaign because you do have undocumented um, people taking the borders to go to vote and informing and educating the borders. So it's unique because that's the way uh, the undocumented vote, being part of these uh, campaigns, that are seasonal campaigns, but also voluntary campaigns. Nobody gets paid. It's just them going out to knock doors, tell the people that this allowed to vote, that this raised to vote, it's time for you to vote. This is the way that you can vote in, in the favor of the community because we always support proposals in favor of the community, regulations in favor of the community, no candidates because we are a C3, but we are used for community proposals or community laws that are uh, uh, supporting basically like renters, like people uh, working in different areas, like driver license was a big campaign you know, that we were getting voters in favor of driver license for years and years. And just want to say also that, to be transparent, uh, none of these folks who are helping getting out the vote, vote. Uh, um, they they had to be documented to, to be part of the process. It's about educating the public. And oftentimes, these canvassers, uh, phone, you know, bankers, um, volunteers, know more about, about the law and what's being in suggested or, or proposed than the, the, the daily um, you know, citizen. Um, so they deserve a lot of credit for that as well. Um, and it's all about educating the public so they can become active and uh, make smart decisions. So I worked as a nanny and I lived in Brentwood for two years, but I didn't see any street vendors. Why? I, I think it's a supply and demand thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suspect that the folks in, in Brentwood aren't accustomed to shopping. Mm -hmm. Um, on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. 
whereas in other parts of Los Angeles with communities who um, have come more recently from abroad and they're accustomed to street vendors, that of course you, you buy things from a street vendor. Mm -hmm. And then there are places that are more mixed, right? Where people, I didn't grow up with street vendors when I was a kid. I grew up in the Mountain West, very suburban, boring community. And I came to Los Angeles and I was just amazed. Wow, you can buy anything you want on the street. This is fantastic. So I embraced it and I think other people are embracing it too. And that's why a, a city with communities like Brentwood in it said, we want this legal citywide. Mm -hmm. And they made that step. And critics worry about street vendors affecting small businesses. How do you respond to these concerns? But this, it's not right. The street vendors is a big opportunity. You just mentioned how street vendors or the street vending culture of the food behind the street vending is getting to the big malls. Now you can see aguas frescas at the mall. You can see elotes at the mall. And that's the food that was basically created by street vending. So it's just matter of the way that things are going to happen, but it's get, everybody is getting rich and they getting profit, getting uh, better flavors, and tasting something new. So it's, it's the culture of Los Angeles. It's the, it's the immigrant people bringing their, their food, their flavor, I mean their colors, their music, even cumbians are everywhere. Everybody wants to dance cumbias everywhere. So, I mean, it's, it's, part of the, it's part of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That's why Los Angeles is that beautiful and it's rich because we are all here. And how has the Trump administration affected street vendors, specifically uh, the undocumented ones? Uh, people are being scared, but still going out to sell because they have to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, in Los Angeles and in California, uh, uh, we are getting protection to, through new laws that are prohibiting the collaboration between ICE and LAPD or any law enforcement agency of the state collaborating with ICE. That was SB 54 that we passed last year to protect uh, the immigrant population, to protect the immigrant workers, and to protect street vendors. Mm -hmm. And have you seen a difference in numbers of those selling in fear of ICE? Uh, I believe yes. But what I'm seeing also is people being in more communication with the police to organize themselves. Mm -hmm. Because they can, uh, there is a project that you can see at uh, the metro station of uh, MacArthur Park, where there is a lot of street vendors that organize themselves that are in communication with the police and they are selling every day. So now those kind of projects are just uh, popping up because the fear. And also, but the police and the city are helping us in the way that we don't have to fear the LAPD in that way that happened before, that I explained, that stops. And we don't have to fear the city to be chasing day laborers or, you know, and day laborers and street vendors. So now the city is having a different approach and the state. So that helps. And what do you think the future holds? Greg, we'll start with you. Well, uh, this is a happy time, right? Because we got these new laws saying that street vending is not criminal anymore and cities need to take a light touch mm -hmm. if they're gonna regulate it. Um, I'm hopeful. Um, I hope that the, that the permits are affordable. I read in the news recently that the city of Huntington Beach came out with a street vending program where each permit costs $263 a year. That's a fair amount of money. And, and my concern is that if the permitting costs in Los Angeles are similarly high, that some vendors are gonna say, well, what, why should I even bother? And they're gonna remain in the shadows. When the whole point of the law is to bring people out of the open, make people part of the community um, so that everyone is following the rules, everyone's paying taxes, and so you don't have this, you know, this feeling that it's us versus them or they're not a that's not a legitimate way to make a living that, that you hear that criticism levied at street vendors. We, we, they should be part of the community, they should be out in the open. And, and I'm hopeful that the regulations wind up making it possible, being realistic so that people can vend, that the permit fees aren't too high, that there's plenty of space, that the restrictions don't wind up being too onerous. Mm -hmm. So that's my hope for the future. I hope this winds up being a real, a real positive change for street vending. Antonio, would you like to add? There is opening a new kind of street vending 
in Los Angeles that is called the Healthy Food Card Incentives that you can sell like fruits that are fruits that are uh, organic and what's what's going to be the the reward for you the reward for you is that your permits going to be free or very little and also you can get closer to the door of the school mm -hmm. so and then that's the way that they are going to be uh, creating a new uh, kind of street vending that is going to be healthier and better for the community. Mauricio, would you like to add on? Uh, yes, I think uh, we're hopeful. Uh, good times to come. Um, th having these conversations is really critical. Or it's critical, you know, to um, to educate the public about the real issue, but also how do we advocate for change? Mm. Um, we are actively going to Sacramento. On the state level uh, and also in the national level to try to make um, some changes and hopefully get some some of this um, um, law passed soon. Well that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our guests Greg, Antonio, Mauricio. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I need to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Why can't I eat, eat, eat apples and bananas? Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. I came to CSUN to learn. I came to CSUN to grow. I came to CSUN to prepare. I learned to ask, to analyze, to communicate. I grew as a writer, a thinker, a citizen. I left CSUN prepared to participate, prepared to contribute, prepared to lead. Aloha, I'm Linda Lingle and I'm a matador. Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on social media at CSUN On Point. You can hear us on KCSN 88.5 FM on Sunday mornings at 5.30. You can watch us on Santa Clarita Valley Television on Sunday afternoons at 5.30 and on LA 36 at 8 Thursday evenings. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Melina Rudigkeit.